I'm so glad you're here and I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dhruv Chandra. My family has been involved in collecting carpets, more specifically my father's twin brother, Mr. Sheel Chandra. Uh, he passed away a few years ago, but he used to collect old and antique carpets as a private collector from all over the world. Uh, he had uh, at one point uh, collected the second largest private collection in Asia after the Sultan of Brunei's collection, where he had a collection of more than 2,200 antiques in his personal collection. And uh, we have kept, uh, as a family, kept 400 of those carpets for a museum that we plan to build. It's going to be India's first carpet and textile museum. And uh, the rest of the carpets, we have a gallery where we we sell rugs and uh, we have a brand called The Carpet Seller, but primarily most of the carpets I'm showcasing to today are carpets from his personal collection, which are important and some of his most favorite pieces. Uh, they are from all over the world and I will give you a little introduction of, you know, what are the different types of carpets that are there and what do you look for when you're buying a carpet. And um, so basically, there's, this subject is huge and I mean it's very difficult to cover it in such little time and there's so many uh, places and, and regions that carpets are made. But I'll try my best we, to, to showcase some of them to you at least to pique an interest. Um, so, you know, carpets have had a huge history as far as our civilization is concerned. The oldest carpet uh, that they found was the famous Pazarik carpet. Uh, it was found in a tomb in Siberia uh, about uh, 2000. It's actually believed to be about two, 3000 years old. And it is right now in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. Um, and those of you who like visiting museums and like to travel, uh, the Hermitage is a special museum where they have a lot of artifacts, a lot of the, the very special carpets that are there. And not only do they have carpets, they have a very good tapestry collection and of course many important artworks. So if you get a chance, you must go and see it. This is the carpet uh, that we're talking about and uh, it was found in a tomb. So they used to have burial ceremonies where carpets were placed with the person's favorite things. And because it was such a, co such a cold place where it was minus degrees, it survived these thousands of years. So it's believed to be 5th century. And uh, you have different horsemen uh, in the border areas. If you can, I don't know, the people at the back might not be able to see it, but uh, you know, you have a lot of different animals. And this is actually a fragment because part of the carpet was damaged. So this is my uncle, this is his collection. He collected these pieces, Mr. Shil Chandra. And uh, so I'm showing you some of his most favorite carpets. Um, so Typically, carpets are always named after the city, tribe, or village that makes it. And uh, normally, every uh, country has different uh, cities that are making them, and each city has its unique identifying knotting structure, the colors and dyes that are indigenous to that region, and uh, the workmanship, the people, the, st the patterns that they use are ind indigenous to the areas. I personally, I mean, carpets are a bit like art. So, it, you know, people ask, what is a good place to buy carpets or what is a good region for carpets and this is very personal so I'm going to show you the different types that are there uh, or at least my favorite types or some of my favorite types and then you see what you like and it's it's also about color it's about uh, negative spaces positive spaces positive spaces are the part where the pattern is negative space is the empty space where there is a so you try and create harmony and balance when you're looking at design and um, like old rugs, a lot of people think old carpets or antique carpets are really expensive or they are expensive because they are 100 years old or 200 years old. It's not because of that. The reason why they are considered rare or they are considered things of value is that because the workmanship that went into making of these carpets at that time was different from how it is done today. Uh, today, carpets, or when you make, when you talk of new carpets, people come with upholstery fabrics and try and match colors, and they are not really bothered so much about the quality. They just want something which goes well with the with the decor. 
and this is not how carpets were made 400 years ago or 500 years ago, which was actually the golden rule of carpet making. So these are some of the Persian cities. So Persia is Iran. Iran is one of the most renowned places for carpet weaving. And these are what we call city carpets that we are talking about. So they are typically decorative carpets like uh, the ones that I'm going to point at. This one here on the left, this is a, a Persian Kirman. It's a tree of life design. Um, this is a hundred year old piece. Um, these are, you see the old carpets were always made using natural dyes or natural pigments. Uh, when you look at new carpets, when we compare new carpets to them, new carpets are made with aniline dyes. So they are, they are what we call chemical dyes. So when you look at a 16th century Rembrandt painting or some old painting, the dyes used on those paintings or, or the dye stuffs and the pigments that they used on those paintings are different from how the colors are in modern art. Similarly, in carpets also, there used to be a difference in the quality of the dye there used to be a difference in the, uh, the way the carpets were made at that time. They used to make carpets that were commissioned and there were famous weavers that would commission some of the best uh, uh, carpets which were commissioned by the kings and the shahs and the rulers and people of nobility, of aristocracy who would say like, you know, I'll, I'd like a big carpet for this room. I'd, uh, my daughter likes the pink color and, and I want this carpet to fit this room. It was commissioned you would say it was also made with the labor of love. So you would use the best ingredients, you would not compromise on the quality of the, the materials used, on the dye stuffs used, on the type of person who wove it, somebody who wove it had 30, 40 years of experience. And also people in those times also a little different from our times where they took a lot of pride in their work. There was, a, if somebody told somebody that let's dilute this quality by 10%, nobody will know the difference. That person refused to do this kind of work and, and not make a carpet. So there were very famous people who were involved in uh, carpet weaving. And uh, this is one of the reasons why carpets or old carpets are much better than what is produced today. It's also the time taken when you make a carpet. So we'll show you some of the different examples. Uh, this carpet here it is a hundred year old Persian carpet from the city of Kashan. Kashan is in central Iran and uh, it's considered to be really, really spectacular. Uh, you know, the, the workmanship, if you see the, the base color is made with a special dye. It's called ma English madder. Madder is a creeper. They use the flowers from this creeper to make the madder dye. The blue is from indigo, the indigo plant originated in India and then went westwards. It's a very expensive and, and time-consuming dye to make. Of course, India has a lot of dyes and people, a lot of people are still doing a little bit of indigo, indigo dyeing, but it's not really that prevalent, uh, you know, when you talk of it in commercial terms. So today, all the carpets that are produced are all made with aniline dyes. They're made with chemical colors. So those colors also start looking bad after a certain amount of time. But with natural colors, if this is a hundred year old carpet, whatever fading had to happen has happened in this time. And if you look after it well, it should last your family's collection for a fair amount of time. We'll just go through them a little bit quickly because there's lots of carpets to see. And I mean, I could go on telling you about every carpet, but we'll just keep moving. And um, this next carpet I'm showing you is from a very famous weaver called Mohatasham. There were famous masters like, uh, there was Haji Jalili in Tabriz, there was the beer in Kashan. This one is a the beer on the floor, and the one on the wall is made in 1880. It's made by a famous master called Motasham. So he, this is from his workshop. These are very supple kind of pieces. You can also see from the style, even though it's from Kashan, the the uh, the first one, the second one, and the third one come from the same area. The colors are all different, but it, there is similarity in the flowers. If you l look at it closely, you'll see a lot of different species of flowers that are in there. This carpet behind us on the wall is made by the beer also. So you can see a similarity between this the beer and that the beer. These are both made by the beer. So this is made with very fine gossamer wool. It's like silk or like cashmere. It's got a, a sheen. 
and they sometimes used to import very special wools from Manchester in England, which was clothing quality wool. So this carpet is already 100 years old, it will last you another 100 years easily. You just have to keep them dust free and look after them. But uh, these have come from important collections of uh, people from eminent families uh, and royals and, and all kinds of people. Time. This next one is called a Guldasta design. It's also from the Kashan, uh, from Kashan as well. Um, this is from the 1940s. So you can see how the styling changes. The flowers are becoming bigger. Uh, the colors are slightly different to the earlier pieces. Um, and that's how you can also identify. So when you, when you look at a carpet from Kashan and if you want to c compare it to any other city like Kerman or Isfahan or Tabriz or Yazd, each one has its unique identifying knotted structure. So if I tell my weaver in India that in Jaipur or in Agra or in Varanasi or somewhere else to make it, they will only know their knotting. Also what happens is the wool available in that area is also um, different from Persian wool or Afghani wool or Turkish wool. So you can identify and this is how you dis differentiate between carpets. Typically when most Indians talk of Persian designs, they're talking of Kashmiri carpets which are copies of Persian designs. These are original Persian pieces. Yeah. This is natural. This is natural dyes, yes. Yeah, they, they've got in alan aniline dyes in the late 1800s, but um, I, I would say, I think it was around 1860s that they got it into clothing, but by the time it reached carpets, because these people were really sort of far away from all of this, they, it took some time for, for um, it to come into carpets. This next one is another example of a Motasham rug again from 1880. So you can see the workmanship, the craftsmanship, how many different species of flowers there are. They have a distinct characteristic, you know, the Motashams. Some, some carpets are signed, some are not, and a signature doesn't, I mean, it's always nice. But sometimes some of the most spectacular carpets were not signed as well. This is a tree of life design with a guldasta in the center pattern. This is called a mirab. And normally you see this pattern in prayer rug designs. This is not a prayer rug, but a lot of, in the Islamic world, they used to uh, also point this towards the direction of Mecca to pray. And um, this is also a 1930s, 1940s Kashan. Um, very nice colors, very, very muted, very understated. This next one is another example of a Motasham Kashan from 1880, 1890. Uh, the previous two examples I showed you had a deeper color. This is a lighter pastel tone. But you have to see how much detail there is, how many hundreds and thousands of species of flowers they have. Uh, when we make new carpets, you typically take 10, 15 flowers out of that and, and fill that in the entire rug. But with a carpet, like let's say the one behind us, uh, which is a, a, the beer, uh, like look, if you look at this, you have different species of of flowers, you have carnations, lilia, lilies, dahlias, roses, irises, and how, you know, if I gave you a bouquet of flowers and I give you 10 flowers and I say put them in a bouquet together, uh, you have to look at it from a size point of view, color point of view, how would you put it together and look at the, the master who drew, uh, drew the naksha of this, so, you know, so carpets like these, First, you require somebody to draw out a naksha, which is a graph. It's plotted to the full size of the carpet that you plan to make. So, a naksha of this kind of carpet could take you a very, very long time, a few months perhaps to make. And then you start making the carpet uh, and they knot it as per their instruction. This is what happens in city carpets, which are what we are showing you right now. Which are So, city carpets generally tend to be much more uh, floral and curvilinear in nature. So I'm going to show you the differences between city carpets and village rugs, which are the two basic categories. So you have nomadic carpets like the ones on your right side. Those, uh, the f not the first one, the second, third and fourth carpets are more geometrical. They are more angular lined. 
Um, these are more crude looking, they are nomadic it, because th these are not made with nakshas, these are made by tribal people. And we'll show you some of the, the city rugs here. This is the one behind me is also another very beautiful Persian Kirman carpet. So this is called, uh, called the mille fleurs design. Mille fleurs means a thousand flowers in French. And uh, these were made for the European market. So you can see the styling is different. The colors are very pastel. It's made for, us, for something which was in vogue during a certain time. And that's what happens. So like how do you date and identify carpets is by looking at what was in fashion at that time. Uh, a carpet made in 1900 would be different from a carpet made in 1950 and something that's made in 2022. It's like, it's like fashion that used to happen in cars. If you look at a Rolls Royce made then, uh, it would be different. If you look at furniture, it was different. And similarly in carpets also, it's like that. This is one of the last examples of the Kashan styles I'm showing you. This is a central medallion, typical Kashan style, where you have the central medallion here. You have the scrolling vines and you have the four corners. This is made in 1920 also. The next town we're talking about is Kirman. Kirman is also one of the famous cities. So this one on the wall on your left is a Kirman and so is this one here. These are, that, these are the Milfla styles. And this one is a signed signature piece. This is a signature right here at the top. This is called a Shah Kirman and this is from 1880 or so. So if you see the flowers in Kirman are different from the flowers in Kashan, if you notice them closely. Uh, this next one is an example of a mill flowers, which is a later period than this one. This is from the 40s and 50s. Uh, so again, you can see it's made more for a European palette. Uh, the colors are very nice. It'd be nice for a lady's room or something like that. This next one is also a Kirman. It's got a gorgeous midnight blue center feel. Very unusual naksha. This is made in 1920. This is called the Cypress tree design. This is a Shah Kirman from an older time. So you see the colors are different. This is from 1880 or so again. So this is supposed to be the cypress tree design. And the cypress tree is supposed to symbolize the beginning of life. So there's a lot of uh, symbolism that goes into carpet iconography. And uh, you know, for us, you normally see flowers, birds, animals. But the idea is that m with most of these uh, designs, they, they're trying to symbolize paradise, or trying, it's another way of bringing your gardens indoors. And I think after COVID, I think all of us realize that we want to be in nature or you want to be as close to nature as possible. Um, so this is another really good example of a Shakir Man rug. This next example is a really gorgeous piece again. Uh, it's got a very nice lustrous wool. This is called Kurk wool. So kurk wool is a really special type of clothing wool which is found in Iran and it has a sheen to it uh, and see how much detail there is in the, in the drawing. It's so elaborate and you know you, you could be sipping a cup of coffee after owning this carpet for two years and then you notice something that you haven't seen before. It's so intricately done. This is an unusual shape for a carpet. In old carpets, they were always mostly rectangular shaped pieces. In the 40s and 50s, they started doing something that the West wanted. So this is a square carpet made in the 40s and 50s. It's got this very nice Manchester wool or very fine Kirk wool. It's really high quality wool. So it's very plush. This could be nice for a bedroom. When you're choosing a carpet for a bedroom, you should choose something which is a little thicker because you tend to walk bare feet. So uh, when you have a plush pile, you feel like you're sinking into it. There are advantages and disadvantages to having a thin pile or a thick pile. A thin pile has a clear definition. When you have a low pile carpet, 
so the definition of the lines would be much clearer. Like if you look at the one below, that's a low pile drug. This is from 1880. This is uh, Shakir Man, Tree of Life. The Tree of Life is a very famous pattern which is supposed to symbolize harmony between the three worlds. The three worlds are humanity on the ground, birds that fly in the sky and what lies beneath the ground. I don't think this carpet has any birds, but you know, in a lot of the Tree of Lives like that one there, that's another Tree of Life, you can see uh, birds, different species of birds living in harmony with each other. So then there are other cities also apart from these cities. These are some of the more renowned cities. You have cities like this one. This is from Yazd. Yazd is also another very famous Persian center for weaving carpets. And um, after this, I'll show you some carpets from Isfahan. Um, for those of who, you who love to travel, Isfahan is considered to be one of the most beautiful cities that I haven't been to yet, but I keep reading about about him. This gentleman knows about a little bit about that world. But uh, Isfahanis were, were really masters of architecture, of drawings. And in fact, in Persian, there's a saying that if you haven't been to Isfahan, you haven't seen half the world. And they are very proud of Isfahan. They, it's, uh, it's got some spectacular mosques, some great arabesques and drawings. And, and their, their craftsmanship and their design was really world renowned. So these are carpets from Isfahan. Isfahanis you can get in a central medallion format like this, or you can also get them in an all over motif format as well. The knotting and structure when you compare an Isfahan, you always look at the back of the carpet. So when you see the back, um, maybe later on you can also go and touch some of the carpets that are there. So you, when you, you must always see the back of the carpet because sometimes you can have that design, but it could be made somewhere else. So you can identify a carpet by looking at the structure. And then when you look at the structure, if you can identify the structure, you'll know that this is a a recreation made in Afghanistan or made in Turkey, but it's actually so. So you can actually uh, very easily tell if a carpet is genuinely made in a particular city or it's a recreation made somewhere else. This is also another example of a great Isfahan rug. This is from about 1910 or so. This next carpet is another example of the Isfahan school. They have a very nice luster and sheen. And also, when you look at carpets, they uh, are light from one side and darker from the other side. So depending on the angle, you know, when you knot a carpet, the knot is not straight up at like that. It's tilted at an angle like this. So the angle at which the light hits the pile makes the color reflect or absorb. So you can, you can you know, when you lay out a carpet, you could lay, lay it out from the dark side in the winter and turn it around in the summers. and it can look like a totally different rug sometimes. It, it's also a measure of the quality of the materials that are put inside it. And the better the wool, the better the workmanship, the better it is. You see, like I was telling you earlier that old carpets were made with very good wools or very, you know, traditionally in, in antique pieces, they only used to primarily use wool or silk. Silk was very f rarely used because silk and, and if, even if it was used, very few of those carpets survived because silk is not as durable as wool is. And wool is a natural fiber that breathes. So they, there's a thing, a lot of people think that, you know, in the summers we should not be using wool because it gets hot. But, you know, that is true if you're buying an inexpensive carpet. But if you buy a good quality carpet, the wool that they used at that time was much nicer. So in, in the summer, it has a thing, they call it cool wool. So it has a quality that in the winters, it'll feel warm. In the summers, it'll feel cool. So these are very good examples of very nice materials that they used to use in Isfahan as well. Um, and the dye stuffs were absolutely spectacular. I mean, now nobody does vegetable dyeing these days, especially in carpets. It's a very time consuming process. It's very uh, It'll become become very expensive to make something in natural dyes today. This is another example of an Isfahan style with the indigo base color. The blue is from the indigo plant again. I'll show you a couple of good examples of carpets from other centers also. Like this one is from a city called Tabriz. Uh, and this is a pictorial carpet. A lot of people hang carpets also. So this could be a nice 
kind of rug to hang. Um, so it's again supposed to depict paradise. You have perhaps a mosque, a building, and uh, a water body, and different types of beings living in harmony. There's lots of s small little stories within stories that are going on here in the border. Um, this is from a city called Birjand. Birjand is another place in Iran. Um, and uh, this is also one good example of a city carpet. So there are these places like Mashhad. This one underneath is from Mashhad. It's a tree of life. Uh, and uh, the one below is actually a signed piece. Um, so it's got a signature right on the top there. I don't know if you can see that. We'll just lift the carpet up. And uh, it's an extremely unusual teal color. You, do, you rarely find this kind of color. And this could also make a really lovely wall hanging or for a bedroom. The colors are very pleasing. You know, there's something about, I, I talk about it like color therapy. Like when you look at things that are beautiful, if you look at a nice painting, you wake up in the morning and you look at a nice painting, it can uplift your mood uh, or, it, or you may not have a reaction to it, you know. So uh, if you are surrounded by things that are beautiful, it, it can change the way you, uh, you know, your day may go uh, sometimes. So this is from Mashad. And uh, the next carpet is from a place called Maud. Maud is a very fine uh, drawing. And uh, they say that like when a hundred good Mashads are made, a Maud is made. It's really, really fine. It's intricate. If you see the knotting, like when you look at the back of the carpet, you can see that the structure, the lines, and the definition are almost the same as the front. Um, and uh, the knotting is not so important, uh, really. But the higher the knotting is, the the more clear the drawing is. So, like when you look at Kashmiri silk rugs, the higher the knots, the finer the de definition is. But in antique rugs, it's not so important as far as the valuation is concerned. A carpet which is 200 knots per square inch could be much more valuable than a carpet that's a thousand knots. But uh, it just depends on the rarity of the piece. And the valuations happen depending upon how many less number of pieces there are in the world and how rare a piece is. Like there were different, like I was telling you, there was different styles and different areas. And um, so each area has a certain reputation for weaving carpets and each uh, reputation has a certain price point. So there is an international market for carpets. You can see what are the price points that, that a certain type is selling at. So we finished with some of the Persian city rugs. And I'm going to show you some examples of nomadic weaving. And um, so these are the two basic different schools, like I said earlier. So you have tribal village rugs, which are made in villages. And um, so we're going to cover some of them. So this is a map of the world, or, or kind of without, it's maybe a bit inaccurate, uh, perhaps. But it's a broad map of the carpet world. And uh, basically, this has some of the cities. I don't know, people at the back may not be able to read that. But you have Iran, Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, Turkestan, and the Caucasus, the broken down. Uh, so we, have, we have Anatolia, which is Turkey. And this is broadly where some of these carpets are from. So uh, we'll start showing you some carpets from northwest Iran. This is uh, from the Hamadan district. This is uh, called a Hamadan style. So if you see the back and the structure of this kind of carpet, it has these white weft threads that are going, which are very distinct and different to other kind of carpets that we've seen so far. Now, these are made by illiterate tribal nomads who move from place to place on horses and camels. They carry their portable looms with them. They, these are not made with an intent to sell. And they primarily make it from a utilitarian purpose. You have weavers who would have, uh, let's say, 20 sheep, 20 goats, 10 camels, 5 horses, so many yaks. And they mix the wool of all these animals. They cut it with a scissor, put it in a pot to die. And that's how they make them. So there is no naksha that is made for these. So you could have a few different members of a family weaving a carpet. You could have a father, mother, son, daughter weaving a carpet. And each one possesses a different skill. So the the thing with this is that uh, there is no symmetry. There is no 
uh, format there is no form when you talk of city carpets on the other hand the carpets appear even though they are handmade they are they can they can have irregularities but you they are not uh, visible to the naked eye but with nomadic carpets that's not the case you will have irregularities in weave and this is a part of uh, tribal weavings this next example is also from the hamadan district this is i was showing you a carpet with the cypress tree motif earlier and this is another example of a cypress tree motif there which is um, supposed to si signify the beginning of life this is from 1900 uh, so it's about 120 years old or so this next example is also the lattice design like these are supposed to be jalis like you see a lot of this in Mughal architecture in Islamic architecture and these are these were the screens that were meant to protect you from the different kind of weather and also act as cross ventilation and the idea is you're looking through these screens into the gardens and uh, it's another geometrical representation of tribal art and uh, and actually a decorative style of weaving this kind of style also works very well with modern decor so a lot of people think that you know when you're choosing a carpet if you if you have an italian straight line look that only a modern abstract kind of carpet could work but tribal nomadic carpets work best because what happens is that when you are looking at modern carpets Modern carpets are fads and trends, and every two three years the friend uh, the trend would change to something else. But uh, and you know you've invested in a carpet which is uh, you know modern, and then after two three years you don't know what to do with it, and you actually get stuck into a rut of now I don't want to change my decor because I spent some amount of money. So tribal carpets or kilims are very good options if you have a mid-century look or if you have a look where everything is straight lined and linear or if you have a scandic look or a japanese look a modern uh, these kind of tribal rugs go really well and also the most important thing is the dye a lot of people don't emphasize enough on the uh, on the dyes the beauty with the natural color like if you look at this carpet or look at this carpet the colors are alive you know there's because these are natural pigments that are are being used is totally sustainable and this is real sustainability because these kind of rugs are alive the colors are alive and the dye stuffs are also still alive this is also from Hamadan this is also 100 years old uh, this next one is a Caucasian rug uh, so this is from the Caucasus it's called a Kazakh style and this is made in 1880 1890 or so these are this is a two and a half medallion rug but like you know like if it was a city carpet they should have ha completed the third medallion but it's ended here and when you look at symmetry there you'll notice that there's not much symmetry uh, so which makes each piece different like when you make a carpet which is made in a workshop style when it, when you have an aksha you can make multiples of the piece and uh, you know when you, if you make a hundred pieces then you you have economies of scale but as a buyer you don't want that right you want something that's a bit unique and a little bit rare so these are really good examples because if this is from this area this is the only one in the world uh, and uh, if you look in the same village you will find similar designs but you will never find the exact same piece in somebody else's home This next example is a four medallion tribal rug from about 1880 to 1900 time, time. And this is also a really beautiful piece. This has got like camel wool. This is natural camel wool. And uh, the brown comes from walnut. So, you know, they use different dye stuffs uh, to make different colors. The yellow, they use pomegranate seeds. Uh, the uh, pomegranate skin, my, my apologies. The, the seeds they use for the red color, but the skin is used for the yellow color. For yellow, they also use marigold. Uh, they use um, uh, sometimes saffron as well to make the dye. To make green, you have to first make blue then ye and yellow and then mix it together to get the dye going. And, and for the most commonly used dye stuff in tribal weaves is madder dye. 
So it's this English madder, which depending on the mordant that you use to make the dye, you can get anywhere from a baby pink to a rose to a red to a maroon to a burgundy to a deep wine color or even a rust. So um, this is a Persian veramine carpet. This is also really lovely. This is from an earlier period. This is 1870 or so. And it's unusual to find a light background in tribal carpets because the style and fashion in that time was towards more brighter colors. A lot of people wonder why are most tribal rugs in the hues of reds and rusts and blues. And uh, red is supposed to be the color of life. When you put red in a room, the human eye is trained to get attracted to the yellow and the red color first. And also, a lot of the places where they used to make these kind of carpets, they are like deserts, you know, they, they have uh, mostly sand everywhere. So everything is very dusty, dry, dull, morose. Uh, and, and then you have a pop of color. So, uh, and I think that's what's happening in our worlds also. If you look at the interiors that everybody does, everybody's, everything is very mute, muted and neutral. You'll have every, everybody's homes where you have white sofas or cream sofas or ivory sofas or um, uh, taupe sofas or gray sofas. And then, you, you know, if you, a carpet should be bringing a, a, a focal point to the room. Otherwise, normally what happens is that everything just looks like a hotel. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it's important that the, the room tells you something about the person who, who was staying here. So carpets like these add a little bit of character to your home. This next example is from Turkey. Um, this is again the star constellation design. The, you know, they believe in uh, astronomy and the cosmic world and they believe that the stars are a symbol of good luck. So uh, there's a lot of thought that goes into the symbolism. This is called an evil eye motif. So they, that's a talismanic charm that is supposed to ward you of evil. So if you believe in this kind of thing, there's a lot of signs and symbolisms in carpet iconography that also um, you can connect with if you believe in this sort of thing. This is a symbol of fertility. This is a Persian carpet. So I'm, I've taken three examples of different Paisley Bote designs. You see these in Indian shawls, like the Jamawar shawls. So this is called the mother and child motif. So you, it's a Paisley Bote design. So the mother is outside and you have the womb inside. So they want that the bride to be when she weaves her carpet, she, go, she has lots of kids. So, so pomegranate is also another good example. Like if you look at the carpet on the, on the left there, that's a pomegranate Samarkand from Uzbekistan. And that, a pomegranate is also considered to be a fertility symbol. It's uh, considered to be a symbol of abundance as well. It was mentioned in the Quran as a fruit that you get in heaven if you do well in life. This is also another one. Uh, this is uh, from the Hamadan district of northwest Iran. This is a Paisley style also. So you can see how varied the Paisleys are. The next example I'm showing you is another Bote design. This is from a tribe called Afshar. The, the tribe is Kutlu Afshar. And this is also from eastern Iran. Hatai. As you can see, there's lots of cross migrations of tribes that have happened, uh, you know, like when you get married from one tribe to another. So you also take your design influences. So this is from Afshar. These were actually Turkic tribes that eventually o over centuries moved to Iran. So they brought their weaving influences to specifically Afshar and that region. Um, so I'll show you some good examples of uh, Afshari rugs. These are this next, ex uh, there's four or five of these Afshar styles. And we can always keep going back to um, some of these um, examples of tribal and decorative, uh, tribal as well as some of the decorative styles that I showed you earlier. This is a star constellation design. And if you notice, there's an abrash. Like if you see, there are gradations. And with... Um, there is, there is a technical term called abrash, A-B-R-A-S-H, and this is supposed to uh, create movement. You know, if you look at the base color, or if you look at this color, there are gradations within each, within each color. 
And this happens because of three reasons. Once, one is that when you take the different uh, animals, wool, the DNA properties of horse hair versus camel wool will be different. So it creates movement. So uh, the amount of dye each fiber will take in will vary. And also if you're doing, if you're taking let's say 200 flowers from 10 bushes, and they'll all have different degrees of dye. So this creates the colors to be alive. Uh, this carpet has an example of a third kind of a brush, which is a shade band a brush. So when they were weaving this carpet, they wove it like this, they ran out of wool at this point. So at the, the, they dyed the same lot of wool. This whole carpet would have originally been this color, but in 100 years of use, the colors have changed and saturated over a period of time. So this is not considered to be a defect. Uh, if this was made in a new setup where we were making it in a factory environment where it was done in, at a fixed temperature or with a fixed formula for making the dye, it would be a big boo-boo. But in this sort of uh, uh, weaving, this is an inherent characteristic of tribal art and this is how carpets were made and this is a good way for you to tell that a carpet is naturally dyed or is somebody just saying that. Hatay? So the next two carpets are also examples of carpets from Afshar, from Southeast Iran. These are also again nomadic weaves. They have a, quite a lot of vivid colors, the patterns and the motifs are very different. You have the ram hair designs, the ram hair is supposed to be uh, considered to be another fertility symbol. Um, and uh, because the uh, ram is considered to be uh, the most virile creature on the planet. So again, they want lots of kids. This is another example of a nice uh, afshar rug from southwest, southeast Iran. Colors are really vivid, bold, it's dramatic could be nice in a study or an office. This next example is from the Hamadan district again. This is Persian again. Um, this has got that special weave that I told you about earlier. It's that, that dotted kind of weave which is very uh, indigenous to this area. And look at the detail and the drawing. It's got a central medallion and lots of different flowers again. This is from about 1900 or so. And if you look at, we've shown you about five, six of these afshars, all of them look so different to each other, even though they are very similar looking, but the motifs and the styles, this is another example of the lattice pattern. So if you see this, you, it's like the jalis that you're seeing, and you see the different flowers through the jalis. This is another example of an afshar rug with the star constellation motifs in the border area. This is another very good example of carpets from uh, the Shiraz and Kashkai belt. This is western Iran, southwestern Iran actually. and. Um, so this is from 1880 or so. This is a beautiful Kashkai carpet. Uh, really nice, unusual motifs. You have, th these are called guls, or they're the open flower motifs. And you have lots of different examples. You have the ram head motifs here in the center, which is again a fertility symbol. This next one is also a great example of a Kashkai style. Kashkais are considered to be slightly finer than the Shiraz carpets. Um, so if you see the knotting, that's how you identify Kashkais are much more intricate. Like this one, the next one are also Kashkai rugs. So there's an area called Khamse. And I was telling you earlier about the, the different hairs that they use. If you look closely at the fringe sides, the, this is how you can tell like they've used wool from different animals. So that's how the colors change. This is also from the last quarter of the 19th century. This carpet is from the Kashkai belt again, from southwest Iran. 
So you have different motifs. You have the star constellations there. You have an evil eye motif right in the center. There's lots of different designs and motifs. And sometimes uh, you have the S pattern, which is supposed to symbolize life and water. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, they take design influences from all cultures also. So there's a lot of cross-cultural stuff that goes on as far as the iconography of the design is concerned. This is the last uh, rug that I'm going to show you from Iran. And this is another lattice design of Shah's style. I think that was a lot of carpets to see. <laughs> but um, I'm going to take you to another different part of the world. We'll go back to the to the drawings and uh, this is from Turkestan or, or, or Uzbekistan actually. See the karke So this carpet is from the famous um, cities of Samarkand uh, and, and they are very quirky carpets. So this is you know Uzbekistan uh, if you guys like to travel again a destination to visit a must do. Uh, it's very primitive. They don't have the fanciest of hotels, but if you can live without that, it's, it's really breathtaking. I mean, they, their pottery, um, their architecture is spectacular. This is made, by, made in Xinjiang, which is very close to the Chinese border with Uzbekistan. So you have this Great Wall of China design in the borders. Th these are supposed to be, no, they're known as vase carpets. So these are very eclectic. And like, again, people who like modern styles, you have different vases with different, uh, you have pomegranates. This is called the Buddha fruit, which is a type of fruit we don't get in India, but it's found in that part of the world. And um, this is again supposed to signify paradise. This is a different style, knotting and structure. If you see the color palette is very different from a Persian style as well. And this next example is also from the same area. These are called the gardens of pomegranate. So there's one example there, uh, right behind that I showed you earlier. That's also a garden of pomegranate from Uzbekistan, same area. This is from 1880 or so. Th uh, this motif is called the cockfoot. And the cockfoot is also considered to be a symbol of good luck. This is another example of a Khotan rug. So you can see a lot of design influences that are coming from China as well uh, because they use some of the more oriental motifs in that part of the world. This is another example of the same style. This is also from the last quarter of the 19th century. Very light pastel colors in the border. So it's a very different style to the Persian styles. Uh, even though you can see some influences from Shiraz, from, from southeastern Iran, but this is Uzbek. This style is from a place called Kashgar again. This is uh, the Turkestan area, which is uh, very close to where the broken down Soviet Union would be now. So these are made by the Kashgar tribes. So if you see the colors are different to the Persian style, but you, you can see some similarities in design. It has a very unusual green color. Green is very rarely used in carpets. Uh, because most of the weavers in the world are Muslims and uh, green being Allah's color, they don't use it on the floor generally. Nowadays, of course, everything happens, but uh, this, is, this one is a great example from Chechnya. It's from the 1930s, uh, perhaps 1940s, and uh, it's got really nice rich wool, very vivid colors. The next example underneath also is a three medallion Kazakh rug from the same part. Uh, these are the broken down uh, Soviet states. So you have Azerbaijan, Dagestan, um, and, and, and places like that where you'll find a lot of these kind of rugs. This is another very vivid color. If you see so many different uh, colors that you have in this style of rug, this is over a hundred years old. And you can see the brush, the subtle gradations in color. This carpet is also a great example of tribal weaving and tribal art, where you see that the carpets are not straight exactly because there's no naksha that was made for it. You have the star constellation designs, you have the ram head motifs, you have the evil eye motifs. 
the designs are not straight but this this has a very cool look to it it's got a very nice informal vibe to it for a family area or family room or a study or an office it'd be a great piece to add to your collection these are supposed to be eagle kazakhs this is a turkish style from the last quarter of the 19th century these are uh, four medallion e eagles an eagle is a symbol of power so this is a geometrical representation of an eagle and uh, it's got great abrash if you see the shades within the carpet uh, it's beautiful dye beautiful colors also what happens is the abrash creates depth in the carpet like if it's a chemically dyed carpet like if you look at a modern made carpet like the big carpet under the the um, table there it's a new carpet it's made with aniline dyes this one is chemical is a natural dye so when you see a, a aniline dye color the color will be flat uh, we try and recreate the same thing when we make new rugs but it's just impossible to do it this is another very uh, good example of a caucasian style with a three medallion motif and it's got a very unusual matter dye again like you we were seeing mostly reds but this is a different style of matter and see how the color changes um, as, as, as it's aged and there's a certain patina to it you know of an aged carpet also uh, carpets like these also are considered to be a great investment like uh, if you look at some of these carpets I'm going to show you some examples this is a Mughal uh, meal flowers on, on the TV the, the this is a star lattice design this is one, one of the most famous Mughal designs which sold for a record price of 7.7 uh, .7 million dollars at a Sotheby's auction actually it was Christie's sorry was it I think it's Christie's yes yeah, sorry so it's the lattice style this is uh, the pearl carpet actually also that was um, it's one of the most famous Indian carpets uh, which uh, was made by deer skin and pearls and belonged to the Baroda family they sold this for I think 5.5 .5 million dollars at Sotheby's in Doha and if you want to see it it's at the museum um, the National Museum in Doha uh, it's a really gorgeous carpet and um, it's a tr it's a real sight to see this is a central Persian Isfahan rug uh, which was estimated at 800,000 to 1.2 million dollars uh, and this was part of the Clark collection uh, which was uh, there was a big auction uh, where the world's most record-breaking price carpet sold for a ridiculous price this is this one was sold for 4.65 million dollars um, then this is another example of a Christie's silk Isfahan rug uh, which is made uh, in the f l late 1500s and this carpet was sold again for 4.45 million dollars uh, this is a polonaise style of carpet which are really some of the most exa uh, exemplary examples of 16th century carpet weavings this was the golden era of carpet making um, uh, in the 16th century Iran was considered to be the best time as far as carpets as investment is concerned this is an another example of Sotheby's uh, in London uh, this carpet in 2009 was estimated at a very low estimate but this sold for 4.3 million dollars is another great example of a Safavid carpet which was patronized by the Safavid kings and this is the world record price this is a this is called a Kerman sickle leaf rug this is also from the I think it was the 16th century if I'm not mistaken and this sold for 34 million dollars uh, which is almost 237 crores I think uh, rupees um, and this is considered to be one of the more world's most record uh, I mean it's a remarkable carpet it was in mint condition uh, for the age and th they needed to build a museum and they let go of this rug because they had to build the museum I think it was a good cause and and it's got some uh, it's got at least three times the original estimate of what it was expected to sell for uh, then we'll show you some examples of tribal carpets this is a dragon carpet it's a Caucasian dragon rug um, and this would be 17th century this sold for 170,000 euros um, 
this is a very typical Bukhara style of carpet which we see a lot of in India which has been copied a lot in India but this comes from a very rare tribe which is called the Salor S group um, and this sold for almost two hundred thousand dollars uh, two hundred thousand euros um, at uh, this this wa this was in the textile museum so India also produced some really good carpets uh, and believe it or not, we really had some of the most spectacular rugs that were made in the 16th century under the patronage of King Akbar. And he brought in master weavers from Iran to teach the prisoners in the jails how to weave carpets. And these are famously known as the Agra jail carpets. So they brought in these masters to teach the prisoners how to weave the most spectacular rugs and they were made in big sizes, 100 feet, 200 feet long sizes. Very few of those carpets have survived, but the ones that have survived sell for phenomenal sums. And most of them are in collections. They used to use pashmina to make some of them. They used to use the best of dyes to make some of them. The designs and the drawings were very rare. And the best known uh, jails were Amritsar, Lahore, uh, Agra. But in it internationally, everybody calls them Agras. but they are actually uh, from different parts of India. They are from the Deccan, they are from Yeroda, which is Pune now. And uh, like that, you have lots of examples. This one is from Lahore. Uh, this is from 1920s, 1930s. Got very nice soft wool. Uh, but Lahore, if you, if you go to the Met in New York, or you go to the Victoria Albert Museum in London, you see a lot of good examples of great Indian and Mughal carpets. And it's something to be proud of. You see some of our finest rugs in the museums around the world. And hopefully, we'll try and change that by getting some in India as well. This next one is a great example of Agra jail weavings. Uh, this is called a Herati motif. It's called the fish motif, actually. And this is from Amritsa uh, from the 1920s. And this is made with madder again. And we come to the last carpet. So this, this is a great example of a tree of life rug. I'm sure you've seen so many of them. We like There's a lot of rugs to see in such little time. So this is a tree of life. And you can see the different beings, the different flowers living in harmony. The last point I want to talk about is building a collection. You know, like carpets, uh, most people would not buy it really to because just because the price is appreciated. You have to buy carpets because you love them. And you would buy things that pique your interest, pique your eye, what is the style of your home. And I think today you've been able to see a vast variety of carpets from different areas, different regions. Uh, and this would give you some sort of a sense of where your calling is, where your direction is, what are the things you like, what are the things you like. You may like different things for different rooms, different, uh, and, and you know, each, each thing, there's no, no perfect formula that are, are these better or the, are those better. It just depends on what uh, is you like. It's, I just always believe that you should go by what you like and go by your eye. Your eyes are always correct. Uh, you know, you can always get come to somebody like me or somebody who knows a little bit about carpets um, uh, and, and get an opinion from a quality perspective, but you should always go by your eye and train your eye. The more you see, the better your eye becomes. It's a bit like art. The more paintings you see, uh, you, know, you, you know what you like and what are the colors, what are the styles, and then and what you don't like. So um, I think I'd like to end the talk. It's been quite long and, and we need to fill up those glasses. And uh, thank you all for coming. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, let me know. Thank you. I think it could be a good storyteller like me, <laughs> but, but, but no, I, I, I really uh, think that uh, of course carpets have stories, every carpet has a story and you, it's up to you to be able to identify with it and, and, and see what you see in that carpet. But uh, I mean, yes, carpets are not perfect, like I mean, even uh, any ki kind of carpet 
there are flaws like uh, when we're talking of per inch you're talking of you are noting a knot 400 times in an inch or 800 times in an inch or 100 times in an inch uh, if you were doing any job uh, i'm sure you'd make one or two mistakes so uh, and in a carpet in a whole carpet like if you have a big carpet there are millions of knots so i'm sure there'll be a few thousand mistakes not uh, uh, no, I don't think it's deliberate. It's 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 human nature. I mean, you, nobody can make anything which is perfect unless it's a machine. And why would you want it to be perfect? There is some there's something which is nice about it having a natural uh, thing to it, and you know something which is a you know there there and, and it's been done by somebody who tried his best or her best. You heard this mostly in, in Afghanistan when they said the deliberate uh, flow. Yeah, you, on the geometric patterns. Yeah. The perfect uh, geometry is yeah. not there. Is not there because yes. they say the only like they, 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 they made the statement. Yes. yes. You see, I, I think you missed that part earlier, but when, you, when we talk of the decorative carpets like these, which are the city carpets, they make a naksha for them. So a naksha is fairly accurate. You can deviate, you can make a 5%, 2%, 1% error. But in a tribal rug, there's no naksha. So if the guy sees, if he's knotting a carpet, he sees his daughter there, he'll plant her in the carpet. If he sees the chicken moving, he'll put the chicken in the carpet. It's just depending on what is going on in his mind, what is he feeling, and he will uh, create that design. So, uh, in nomadic weaves, there is no order. So, it could be anything. What would be the timeline that you would talk about from city carpets to nomadic carpets? Like, how much time would a certain, like a six by nine day? It depends on the density of the knots and how much time you work. Like, you see, if you work in, in India, in a factory environment where you're supposed to work from an X time to an X time in the evening, then it would take you like maybe three, four, five months to make a carpet. Uh, but if you were doing it in a nomadic setup, you could maybe spend four years making it because it, you know, you decide that I'm going to work two hours today and then I have to go, you know, cut some, uh, some, some, some things, some fodder for the cattle or do something else. I mean, it just depends on, uh, there's no, uh, like, especially in tribal carpets, there's no time. Like they must, they, some carpets could have taken uh, six months to make or two months to make or some could have taken a few years to make. So it just depends on that also. But uh, city carpets, I mean, typically carpets can take anywhere from two, three months uh, to a few years to make. Like big palatial sizes, like, like let's say that kind of size, if you were to do it in this kind of quality, it would take maybe four or five years to make in a factory environment. But they used to, like, uh, when they used to make it for these kings, there was, there was no expense spared. There was, they would say use pashmina. So one of the reasons why that carpet sold for $34 million versus let's say it didn't sell by fluke for $34 million is because the work, you know, the, the material that went into it, today when we make new carpets, let's say uh, from, for numbers sake, uh, you use wool between 300 to let's say 1000 rupees a kilo. Uh, pashmina is 20,000 rupees a kilo. So if a carpet is 60 kilos or 70 kilos when you see it, when they make the pile height, it's originally this high. And then they clip it, they clip it, clip it, bring it finer to bring it as low as you can. And you actually might throw away two thirds of the wool because they were not <laughs> recycling it or reconditioning it in those times. So you could spend, you could make a carpet, you could use maybe 100 to 200 kilos of pashmina in a carpet which actually weighs 60 kilos. And because it was not made at a price point. Today, when we make new carpets, you work backwards. You say, uh, okay, a six by nine should sell for an X price, which is what most carpet companies do. We don't, but uh, that's not the correct way to make carpets. The cor correct way to make carpets is that you should find what's the best wool that is supposed to be used, what's the best silk to be used, who is the best weaver who can do it, what is the finest knotting we can do. Uh, and if I tell my weaver that aap ek saal mein nahi banaiye, aap make it in, one, in 11 months, I'm asking him to cheat because he will have to reduce the quality at some point to make, it, make a deadline which a company is asked for. So you have to give them time to make things properly and to be done like how it was done in the good old times. 
See, it's a bit like building a house. So, like, you know, if you were building a house for yourself and you were constructing it yourself, if you plan to spend 100 rupees and your budget went to 130, 140 or whatever, uh, you would say, it's fine, I'm going to give this to my kids, so I'll use, I will not compromise on the material, I will not buy, buy something which is not, which should not be there. And you'd use the best ingredients, the best everything. Uh, whilst it, this does not happen when you do new carpets normally, because people are always looking at prices, people want that it should be within a certain price. You decide before you go somewhere that I think ballpark, this is what you should spend. So when you decide that, then you've already decided that how fine can something be? It's dependent on that price point. So in the old times, they never used to do it like that. They used to do it like the way it should be done. We, uh, yeah, we haven't heard uh, anything after 1950. Uh, all that you could see is like prior to 1950 or... Maybe. Yes, so I was uh, telling you earlier that Carpets, uh, for me, you know, from an importance point of view, are pieces that are 100 years and older. Like any, so from an age point of view, you have carpets which are 20, 30 years old, which we call second hand or used carpets. 40 to 50 years are carpets we call vintage. 60 to 90 years are carpets that we call semi-antiques. And anything over 100 years, we call an antique. So I think from a collectability point of view or somebody uh, you know, if I was to recommend something, I would talk of carpets that are pre-1920, uh, which I think have investment value, which because there's an only a certain amount of pie that is available, and that pie is getting smaller, because, and I can't recreate those carpets. Like a new carpet, I could, if you tell me to make 1,000 rugs, I can do it. But with old rugs, you can't do that. So I think also from a, what happened was that post-1920, or I would say in the 30s, 40s, there was a, the advent of aniline dyes or chemical dyes. So the quality of the colors and the dyes is not the same when you talk of the workmanship, quality of the dye, craftsmanship. You know, it became a little commercial and a lot of mass production started happening post 50s. So that is why I haven't taken that many pieces in, into that, into showing such pieces. In fact, we have pieces that are 16th century, 17th century, but we would have had to handle them with a different way. So uh, maybe we can one day organize a, a show for you to show you some of those pieces as well. Are these from the, your uncle's collection? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Sorry. Sir, uh, I was wondering that uh, how is the density of the carpets counted mm -hmm. in India or internationally? Because as far as I know, uh, in Iran it's like number of nuts per seven centimeters. Yes. But when I say that like this stuff is 50, uh, I, I think that people don't understand me that the density of 50 in mm -hmm. India is 50. Like, how do you say that it's 50? Yes, in, in Iran, they measure the knot density differently to how they do it in different parts of the world. In Turkey, it's different. In India, it's different. So in India, we have different qualities, which we, which we measure uh, from the carpet from one end to the other. Because what happens is that when you, if you just talk of rajas, which are the number of knots per seven centimeters, which is some, uh, a measure that they do in Iran, and that's mostly for new carpets, primarily, not really for antiques. You really don't talk about the knotting really. Not, not, knotting would be a fourth or fifth criteria that you'd look at when you're looking at an antique rug. But um, in India, we not do knots per square inch. Uh, and in, in specific areas like Badoi and other places, they measure the carpet in nine inches. Because you can, if I was a smart weaver and I wanted to be over smart with somebody, I could just keep the, because you always see the corner of the carpet, right? So I could keep the center area very loosely made and I could keep the border very fine. Uh, so when you turn the carpet, you'll only see the, the corner and you'd say this is it. But in India, we do a measure right from the beginning to there. But it doesn't matter really. Actually, knotting is just one of the criteria. I think uh, when you're looking at carpets, I would not put knotting at all as my top, even in my top three or four things that I'd look. I'd look at more the origin of what I like visually, m more importantly. The dyes would be really up there on my list. And then I would look at knotting, structure, who wove it, uh, how, what is the age. The age I would even put before the knotting. 
uh, because I think the age also tells you what the dye would have been. The dye stuff used to make the carpet, especially when you're looking at older pieces, the dye stuff would be uh, older, you know, the dye stuff would be older and better source of the dye. I don't know anybody. I knew somebody who was kind of doing some parts and we were selling some naturally dyed pieces, but it's just, it's five times more expensive. Like, so it's just uh, for most, I think somebody needs to take this on. Maybe, maybe one day it'll happen. I think it is a dying art and uh, in fact, there's a lot of places, like a lot of places in Turkey, for example, and a lot of the carpets being sold in Turkey are being sold by Turkish people who either are importing carpets from India, Pakistan, China. There's a lot of carpets being made in Turkey also, but I would say quite a lot of what is being sold is machine made. Uh, in Iran also it's happened that a lot of the, Iran is the best place for carpets. and. It's just uh, a lot of the carpets that are being sold either are uh, machine made or they ha the, the dyes are not very good these days. The Iranians were the kings of dyes. Uh, uh, but in post 1980s, you feel, see that the, some of the reds and the blues bleed. Like if you look at the nains, a lot of people buy these nain style of rugs, which are what we call newish carpets. The, the structure and the knotting is very, very nice, very intricate. But I feel like the, the colors bleed a lot. We, we are half the time sorting out carpets that have been given to a dry cleaner and they ruin them because they've been put in machines or something like that and the colors bleed. So uh, one should try and see older Persian rugs if you can. I was just saying that there is, uh, you know, we we showed quite a lot of different carpets, and my uh, I, I I think that as a person who is supposedly neutral, like because I mean India is not India produces nice carpets, but we are not really at the top. We produce what we call uh, everyday rugs, uh, but there are some carpets we are producing that are really spectacular also. But I think Persian rugs are the best in my personal view, but. You know, if you go to a Turkish person, they will say that our carpets are the best. If you go to a Kashmiri person, they will say that our carpets are the best. So, you have to decide what you like, right? And and for somebody, uh, like if you, somebody may love a carpet like this, which is very fine and decorative, and then somebody could say, but I actually prefer something like that, which is very uh, crude and coarse in comparison. It's not uh, so fine as far as a refined. That's a carpet, ma'am. It's a nomadic carpet. This is also Persian, that's from Shiraz, the one in the center. But so it just depends uh, on what your personal taste is. So it's a question of uh, finding your own taste and your own way. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a Kirman, ma'am. So this is, uh, f this is called, um, this is a Guldasta design. Uh, it's a meal flowers design. It's meal flowers means a thousand flowers in French. It's made in the 1920s, 1930s, made for the French market. So there's a really nice balance. I was talking about negative spaces and positive spaces. So uh, the positive space is the part where the pattern is placed, and the negative space is the empty part. So there's a really nice harmony and balance in that where they, you put so many thousands of different flowers of different species and different types and then how do you balance and lay them out together. It's a really great example of craftsmanship and also the, the draftsman or the person who was a modern day interior decorator, I guess, who decided what colors are going to go uh, in the carpet and where. Great. I think we are done and thank you so much uh, again for coming and uh, I hope you <laughs> learned something today about drugs and uh, if you ever need any, if you have any other questions you can always call me. Uh, thank you again.